In this video, I'd like to go over a comprehensive list of things that can hopefully help you improve your bevel cuts. Some people refer to them as miters. I'm probably going to refer to them as miters for most of this video, so bear with me. Um, really, this video is for making boxes and things like that, where you want to have a 45 degree angle and you really want it nice and crisp at the end there. Now, bevel cuts for these boxes, miters, are some of the seemingly most simple cuts you can do, but in my experience are some of the hardest to get right. There are so many little variables that can go wrong that can leave you with gaps on the inside, the outside. And, uh, you know, over my couple years of experience here, I've probably made about 70 or 80 mitered boxes, so I figure I have a little something to offer. If you're doing something already that works really well for you, just keep doing it. Don't come and look for even more ways to complicate things. If it, if it works for you and it totally goes against all of this, that's fine. Don't change if you don't need to. We're going to go over eight things uh, that really will help determine how good your miters are. The first is going to be your choice in wood. The second is going to be how we mill the wood. Third is going to be getting our table saw set, if possible, depending upon your table saw, how much adjustment we can do. We're going to go over the blade choice. We're going to go over whether to use a miter gauge versus a sled. We're going to go over how to set the right blade angle. And we are going to go over a little bit of glue up and then the decision between clamps or tape for glue up. So I'm hoping that throughout those there's at least something there that can help you improve your miters if you are having problems. So the basic premise of a mitered box is that you essentially end up with a joint that is nearly invisible and looks like a continuous edge. Uh, if you use a single piece of wood to do it, you will have nearly continuous grain. But what we essentially have to do is make eight cuts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's a lot of cuts. That's a lot of room for error. And that's one of the trickiest things about miters is if you are off even a little bit on each one of these, it will add up. It will multiply over the number of cuts you have to make. So it's paramount that we get ourselves in the best position possible to make sure those cuts work out well. So the first thing we're going to go over is choosing your wood and what to look out for that can cause possible movement issues. Now the most common type of wood you'll find is generally some sort of flat sawn, meaning it will have some amount of curve in it somewhere. Uh, you may also find quarter sawn, which will be straight parallel lines. And then sometimes you'll have wood that is just wild grain. This has this crotch figure, it switches grain. Now one of the most important things about miters is to get these angled cuts right. We need straight, flat, square wood. Now certain types of wood can be very temperamental. I would not have used this piece to make a mitered box. This crotch grain is going to have lots of stress in different ways. Quarter sawn, pretty good, but it's a very specific look. Obviously, we don't want to be too limited in our look. This is some curly maple. I'm going to use this and I think it will turn out fine, though highly figured wood can be a problem too. Crazy figure just usually leads to more internal tension that after you've done your initial milling of wood, you can get some movement. These can end up cupping or twisting. So the first thing I would do is I like to mill my wood in two stages. I like to first flatten one side. I use a planer sled and then I like to remove and flatten the other side. Not all the way to final thickness though. I then let it sit overnight. I come back the next day and I do the process over again and I attempt to remove roughly equal amounts from each side of the board. Obviously, sometimes you're going to have one face that is just really nice and, you know, you want to use it. So in that case, perhaps don't go as thin if you don't have to, meaning don't remove as much as possible from this side. However, sometimes you're just going to do it and that's fine. You know, it may cause problems. It may not. Uh, quarter sawn, known for staying relatively stable this way and tends to cup and twist a little less. Uh, crazy figure, something like this, I'd stay away from. So when you're choosing your wood, yes, aesthetics, that's always for us woodworkers, arguably the most important thing, but just consider how crazy the figure is if you are currently struggling to do your miters. As you get more proficient with them, you can move up and attempt more difficult grain patterns in your miters. 
Now one thing with milling is that even once we get this flat, we still have to put a straight edge on this. And again, some wood has internal tension that even if you remove that bow, it will come back the next day. Now often after getting my final thickness, I will rip one straight edge using my jointing jig from my table saw. I will then let that sit overnight and I'll come back the next day and see what that looks like. If it has moved again, then I'll rip it again, taking as little off as possible and then rip everything to length. Sometimes you're in a hurry and you're gonna just do it at once. That's fine, you're just gonna take a little risk on movement. I'm a big fan of milling things twice and letting them sit overnight between the first and the second. Obviously the first milling, you're not going down to final dimensions so you have room to play with if this does bow again. When you're purchasing wood, take into consideration that if you are trying to get two pieces out of a single board and you have only enough width for a table saw rip down the middle, and these end up bowing, you are going to have a hard time getting that exact same width. Well, you just, you simply won't. Um, so ideally buy a board if you plan to rip two pieces from it that is wider than your final thickness by a couple saw blades at least. Leave yourself some room for error when you buy the board. Ideally, leave, you know, room for error with your thickness. Now I know plenty of people don't have planers. And that means you're gonna get it from either Home Depot, which is tricky, but I've done it before in the past, or you're gonna get it from a lumber mill and it's probably gonna be surfaced. Now, the key with the surfaced lumber mill wood is when you get home, to immediately move it into a dry, cool place. Hopefully that's your shop. I have the, you know, the benefit of time often, some people don't. But at a minimum, you should let it sit in your shop hopefully for a week, uh, that's ideal, sometimes two weeks. The longer you can wait, the better, because when you then go to mill that wood, it will already be stabilized throughout the entire board, ideally, assuming it was dried correctly from the mill, and it should not then cup or twist or bend too much more after you do the two milling sessions. One of the things you have to look out for if you're getting your wood at a place like Home Depot or even from a mill, and you do not have a planer or a jointer at home, is that a lot of times on the end of a board, you know, we're, we're running it through the planer, there will be what's called snipe at the end, meaning a slight dip because as it exits, the, the planer blade wants to pull it up and it takes a chunk out. One of the keys to miters is having exactly the same thickness of wood so that when they meet, they're even. If one is thicker, it will be out further and the other one will be in more. They won't meet perfectly. So when you are getting your board from Home Depot, make sure you're getting a board long enough that you can cut off a few inches at the end because oftentimes Home Depot wood has some snipe. You're obviously gonna look for the, the flattest, straightest board you can possibly find there. I think most people know that. You know, it's a crapshoot sometimes. You gotta, you gotta just take a chance sometimes on a board. I almost forgot to mention that this one is actually made out of pine from Home Depot. Um, there was a board in there 70% off crappy lumber section. I grabbed it because why not? And I'm actually making this exact box out of Home Depot pine uh, or SPF, whatever it actually is. So you definitely can do it. Don't be turned off by the fact that you may only have a Home Depot or a Lowe's. I'm currently doing one out of exactly the same lumber they sell there. And I have really high hopes for this. Just on my initial test fitting, these look really nice. Another thing about cutting miters that I personally always do is I do test cuts. I keep around a bunch of Home Depot pine. Uh, I've got multiple more boards purely for doing test boxes. I'll end up making a very tiny little box so that I can tape it together and find out whether they meet or not. I personally think that's the only way to ensure that when you cut into your nice wood that the corners are going to meet and you are actually at 45 degrees. You're always gonna be taking a chance, no matter whether you're using an angle gauge, a really nice square, whatever it is, it may be wrong. My personal angle gauge, after some testing, has a little room of error about 0.015 degrees. Now that doesn't seem like a ton, but when you add that over, up over eight cuts, you're getting enough error that you will leave a gap. So I highly suggest keeping some Home Depot, whatever cheap lumber around, if possible, you will be much less frustrated if you know before you cut your nice wood that your angles are all set. 
Now before we get to doing setting up at the table saw and discussion of jigs and whatnot, we need to decide what blade we're going to use. Now I personally use a 60 tooth Diablo for all my miters. I find that it is far cleaner than this 50 tooth Freud, certainly cleaner than a rip blade. And while I do sometimes uh, mess around with a 40 tooth Diablo blade, I wouldn't use anything less than 60 unless it's incredibly new. Uh, this just gives me the nicest, cleanest cut of all of these with the least hair out. Now, you can definitely do it with 50s, 40s, whatever, but you're just taking a chance that you're going to get a little tear out at the end. There might be some blade marks. Um, these are about, I think, $40. If you don't have a crosscut blade yet, I highly suggest getting one. If you're getting into building things like mitered boxes and you would like to do numerous of them, this is going to save you a lot of headache from having tear out. And we'll go over how to minimize tear out as well in a little bit here. But this makes the job a lot easier. In regards to the blade choice, uh, as I said, this was cut with a 60. And you can see there are a few tiny blade marks there. But I consider that absolutely fine at this level right here to get a nice tight miter. If you start to get bigger ones and a lot of ones that are more visible, it's probably not going to close as well. Uh, you can attempt to run a little sandpaper over it, but once you start changing that angle, how square it is, how flat, there's a good chance it's not going to glue up as well, which is why I really like to use a blade that will let me get my finished cut right from the saw. Now, if you are a hand plane person, you absolutely can use a shooting board at 45 degrees to get a better cut. So if you are somebody who uses hand planes and you want to do that, by all means, you're going to get an even better finish. I just don't personally use that method. Now, obviously, one of the most important things here is setting up our table saw so that we get the best chance at a 45 degree cut that is square. A lot of you will have a job site saw, which I used for many years and made many boxes on. Some of you have a cabinet saw, contractor saw, etc. Now, the tabletop adjustment is going to be highly specific to your saw in terms of how it's done and whether it can be done. On the DeWalt, as far as I remember, you can't adjust the table, but you can adjust the motor housing in determining how your table lines up with this blade such that when you run something through the miter gauge, you know it is square to your blade. Obviously, when we set up a table saw, we square the miter gauge and the blade, and then we square the miter gauge slot and the fence, and we know we're at 90. So for a job site saw, it's gonna be really dependent upon your saw as to whether you can adjust the table, whether you can adjust the motor housing. Uh, so you're gonna to have to look into that specifically for yourself. I believe this one is motor housing adjustment, but it's been quite a few years since I remember doing this. For most cabinet saws, there are four bolts, two front, two back, and then it's on a pin and you can adjust that way. So before you even get to cutting your miters, make sure your table saw, if possible, is adjusted so that you know this miter slot is square to the blade. So just do what you can to set up the table, if possible. Dig through your manual, dig through the forums. Uh, there's a good chance that if it can be done, somebody has found out and posted it online. So spend time figuring that out and seeing if it's possible. In every miter build, there comes a moment where we have to get this blade to 45 degrees or as close as possible. Now, the majority of problems with miters stem from your wood either being not straight, flat, square, and even thickness, or from this not being set at 45. So one of the key things here that most people use is either a tri-square, speed square, or a digital angle gauge. I use the digital angle gauge. However, what I have learned from over time is that these have error in them. And getting it to say 45 here may actually be not exactly 45. You may be within 0.01 or 0.02 degrees off still, which may not seem like much, but over eight cuts, that error can add up. So one thing I really like to do is I like to make sure that I try it both ways. And by that, I mean I set it to zero here. I tilt it this way, reads 90, or in the case we'll do 45. And then I also tilt it this way and I make sure it reads zero. So simultaneously, we'll go back when we get to the 45 and we'll do it both ways because I've noticed that if you are not right at the angle, it will read differently if you put it this direction or this direction. Oftentimes when you have this on here, 
you are trying to find a spot on the table saw blade that is relatively flat. If you do not have it on a relatively flat spot, or if you are moving it different times as you go to set it, it's quite possible it will read differently. So we're gonna just use these two, or in my case, just this one, to get us really close to 45 degrees. It's nearly impossible to know whether we are at 45 without making test cuts, and that's why I suggest you have some spare wood. So we'll go ahead and we'll try to get this to 45 and see what we can do. Now one thing about table saw blades is they are almost never perfectly flat all the way across. You have these little uh, vent things or whatever they are there. You have some relief cuts here. And there's usually a slight hump in this area right here. Now you are going to have to just assume that your table saw blade is not warped at all. Uh, usually if they are warped, you'll know pretty quick because it'll make a weird noise when you turn it on. So we then have to try to determine where on this blade is best to put this. Obviously we want to avoid the teeth. I generally try to avoid these and these. So what I like to often do is take out my insert and set it a little lower down in there so that I'm on just this area right here. By being on just this area, we have as much reference area as possible. And whenever we're setting the angle, I also like to move it around and really make sure that I'm at 45. So your table saw will have a angle adjustment in either the front or the side, uh, and you will crank it to 45. Okay, so I've now got my blade towards the angle stop, which I've intentionally set a little over to allow me to play with it. So we'll put this on, ideally the flattest area closest to your blade. You'll zero it, of course, and then you'll try to set it, if possible, on this flatter spot. Now some blades, it's just not easy. All right, so we've got 45.15 there. So we're obviously gonna have to adjust this a little bit. And you just wanna go a little bit by a little bit and then let it sit. When you hit 45, let it sit. As you can see there, when I'm tightening the knob, I moved it a little bit. Once we have our blade set to 45, and because we know this has a little error in it, after you stick it on there, pull it off again, reset it to zero, and then put it back on again. Now look at that. That was sitting on there the entire time I was adjusting, and suddenly it's showing 45.20. At this point then, you will want to make another adjustment very slightly at a time. And you will want to get to a point where when you put it on and off, you are definitely getting it 45 degrees every time. So once we've got it at 45, we're going to want to double check by zeroing it here and putting it back on the table. Now, as you can see here, after having this gauge sitting on here for quite a while, it now shows 45.05, which is likely roughly the error within your gauge. You can zero it there, put it back on, always give it a second to stop. Now we're at 45 again, which is very odd. That shouldn't be happening. However, these gauges are not perfectly accurate. Another thing to know is that if you start tilting this at all, it will change the angle, even though your blade has not moved at all. If you start moving this, suddenly you'll get a different angle. So you really want to make sure this is perfectly up and down uh, 90 degrees, I guess you would call it, on the blade. Because if you have it tilted, you will never hit 45 because it will not be reading correctly. So just take that into consideration. Once I have my blade at the correct angle, I like to leave it there until I make every single cut and I've done all my tests. Now. As I mentioned before, I like to keep scrap wood around so that I can make an entire mini box test cut, tape it up, make sure there's no gaps. Sometimes you just don't have the extra wood. Sometimes, you know, it's just expensive too. Even the Home Depot pine can add up over time. So you're going to be playing with fire a little bit if you don't do any test cuts. You're just going to have to hope you got it right. And in many cases, you will and you'll be fine. But sometimes it'll be a little off. Now, for those who are trying to use uh, a triangle to set this up. We have an inherent problem with larger triangles and crosscut blades. Very hard to make sure you are between a tooth and depending upon how many teeth and how thick this is, 
it may be impossible. So one thing I would suggest is that if you are going to use this square method before you attempt doing this and before you buy this, determine how much room you are going to have to actually get the square on there. Uh, they sell mini triangles, uh, which can really help. Another troubleshooting tip can be that if you register off of your insert plate, sometimes this is not perfectly level to the table. And since when we're cutting anything of decent size, we'll be holding our workpiece mainly on the table. I think it's always best to set 45 to the table instead of the insert. Now, you know, sometimes you can't help it and you need to go on the insert. So ideally ahead of time, you will have set that up so that it's perfectly level to the table. Uh, or at least do the best as you can to do so. You often will need to fully retract the blade before you can put the insert back in there. So if you're sitting there going, I can't get this insert back on, retract the blade all the way, put it back in there. If this is your first time doing a miter cut, it's quite likely that if you have a zero clearance insert, it will not be able to turn with the insert in there, in which case you will have to lower the blade all the way, turn the saw on, and raise the blade with the saw on. That's going to be the only way to cut through so that you can go at this angle. Sometimes it helps to have a separate insert um, so that you can just have a zero clearance for all your miters as well. That gets a little pricey and adds up over time, having a bunch of inserts. So just consider that. A, an insert that is pretty chewed up, like this one is, can also sometimes cause tear out issues when it's not at a nice zero clearance. Now I just roll with this because I don't want to spend another God knows how much saw stop charges for their inserts. Uh, but if you're getting a ton of tear out, that's one possible problem. When you're doing a miter cut, bevel cut, you have to have a way to hold the piece and guide it through the blade naturally. Now sleds or miter gauges are your two real options here. If you are going to make a ton of mitered cuts, I would just go ahead and make a sled. Uh, it's just far easier to have a dedicated sled for doing it. Um, I don't have a ton of storage room in here, so I actually use uh, replaceable faces on my miter gauge to make my 45s. This one is purely for doing the miters and bevels. Um, that's also gonna depend on how good your miter gauge is. Obviously some that come with the table are absolutely atrocious. There's a ton of slop in this thing, it's a total mess. When I used the job site saw, I had a sled for it. Uh, I could not get great miter cuts, bevel cuts, without using a sled on this to get rid of the slop. So the first thing you're gonna have to do is make sure you have either a sled or a miter gauge that does not move when you push it through the saw. Um, there are some very nice aftermarket gauges uh, that if you are having trouble with this or building a sled, those are another option. I know there are some videos on how to um, kind of adjust some of the fancier ones to work on job site saws, as a lot of times they don't come ready to fit saws like this, they come more intended for saws like this. Another thing we have to consider is that if we're making a ton of miter cuts, uh, we, we really like to have something close to a zero clearance to avoid tear out. It's very easy to get tear outs on miter cuts, which is why I like to use this dedicated um, fence for this so that I know this is always the same width of the blade. And over time, it doesn't hurt to remake these. Obviously, if you make a sled, you can always add a face plate on front for every time. So that's a really nice uh, way to use the sled while also being able to have uh, a zero clearance cut every time. One way to tell if you're having an issue with your miter gauge or sled is when you go to glue this together, if they are slightly offset, as in these two are not at 90 degrees as well as 45. Now that can also be a sign of twist in the wood. If your wood twists a bunch, they will not, when you go through the saw, it will not lay flat. So part of this will be slightly above and part of it will be slightly below. But those are your two main issues if when you go to line these up, either the top or the bottom is sort of out of the other one. You're either having issues here with your slop or your wood is not flat and it's been likely twisted. It's usually a twist. The cup is generally noticed in the middle of the miter uh, if you have a cup in your board, um, which is easier to fix. Uh, it's a little trickier to fix twisted ones 
um, without really rounding over this corner. So again, that goes back to how we mill our wood. Uh, the idea here is to eliminate every variable as possible so that when you have a problem, you can identify what it is. Now, most modern table saws tilt to the user's left. So in this case, we cut on the right-hand side so that our offcut is on the outside and we're not pinching our workpiece at all. Some people prefer to have their fence end here so that the workpiece is not stuck on the fence at all. That, though, eliminates the ability for you to get a total zero clearance. It's a trade-off. Now, oftentimes on miters, because this is such a fine point, you will end up with this back end tearing out. There are a couple problems for that. One, you're not using a sharp enough, high enough tooth crosscut blade. That's a big problem. Second, you're not using a relatively zero clearance backer plate or miter gauge plate or crosscut sled back. Now, sometimes you just can't help it in some woods tear out like crazy. I've had walnut and curly maple that just over and over, no matter what I did, wanted to keep tearing out. So in those cases, I take a piece of blue tape. You would align your piece over where you're going to cut. You will take a small piece and you will apply it right to the back where it's going to cut through. And this will support this last little end of fiber. Is it foolproof? No. Does it work pretty well? Yes. I personally do it on every single miter cut. I always put a piece of blue tape there. No matter whether I have a zero clearance blade or not, I always use the blue tape. So if you're getting tear out on this back end corner and you don't have a way to put a fresh piece of maybe quarter inch plywood on here or you don't have a zero clearance fence for your miter gauge or cross cut sled or it's just become worn down over time, put the tape on there and more likely than not, it's gonna solve your issue. Now what I will say is that it will gum up your saw blade relatively fast because it's going to be tearing through this tape. So after you do your miters, clean your table saw blade. And if you're doing a ton of them, you may have to take it out or scrub it somehow in between them because it will collect some blue tape on it over time. There's a piece right there from the last time I cut miters. Now, this is another tip that you kind of need to pay attention to throughout your entire build once you have cut the miters. The better your miter, the finer the point this is gonna be, which means they're extremely fragile. Uh, even the slightest dent, uh, a bit of pressure applied can start to dent these a little bit in. And of course, then at the tops and the bottoms, you will not get as nice of a glue up. Even just something like that this is Pine from Home Depot, has put a slight little dent in this. Now, there are ways to recover some dents, uh, but if you put a big enough one in there, it's going to be hard to get out. Now, to recover from a dent, I like to take just a drop of water, I just put it on my finger, and I just drop it right on the edge there. And I'll let that sit for a few minutes. Um, if it's very cold out, you should pro in your shop, you should probably breathe some warm air on that. You can use a heat gun if you're in a hurry. And generally, as long as you haven't torn or broken in half the fibers, small to medium dents will come back out. You don't want to soak this thing because then we're going to raise the grain a bunch. This is going to just get too much water in it. Uh, if your first droplet doesn't do it, every five minutes, come back, do another droplet, and you should see it come back out. Um, this isn't perfect. It's not always going to work for 100%. Some woods repel water more than others, some exotics, uh, and it's going to be a little trickier. But just be really careful after you've cut the miters as to how you handle this. They dent incredibly easily, and that will, at least aesthetically, make your glue up look a little worse. Now, one of the premises of this entire video is flat, straight, square and even thickness. Before we glue up a box, we often want to sand the inside. Personally, I run my planer blades probably longer than they should be. So by the end of it, I have quite a rough surface, lots of nick lines. Okay, now the inside of a box obviously isn't gonna to be touched a ton. However, we want it to have a nice feel. When it is touched, we'd like it to look nice. So we wanna do some cleanup. Now the most important part for the glue up is that these two ends be equal thickness. So you can attack this two ways. You can attempt to remove an identical amount off of every side of your box 
or you can attempt to avoid this edge here and only sand in between the two edges. To do the former of removing an even amount, I highly suggest you make a sanding block that is on either MDF or plywood that you know is flat and you very gently go over these and try to apply an even amount of pressure each way. Due to human hands, oftentimes we apply pressure more in one area or the other. So if I do five going this way, I'll often flip it and do five going this way to at least attempt to make sure it's even. Now you get a feel over time for how to kind of get an even pressure. You have to keep count and you've got to keep the same sandpaper as you're going through. So if you've got a block of 180 here and you've started to sand, you don't want to apply a new piece of 180 because it will take more off of the piece that you're doing it on. So make sure before you start the sanding, your sandpaper is good to go. I oftentimes uh, try to get it to where I only have to do 180 and 220 by doing the other method first, which is sanding just the insides here, which means that we take a relatively small piece of sandpaper and we're just gonna go edge to edge and we're gonna use our fingers at the end here that are hanging off to notice when we need to stop. Now you can use a smaller sanding block and do this as well, but it's very easy to go over the edge. A lot of times I just like to spot sand areas that are a little problematic and then come over with one or two of the sanding block. And I've had pretty good success over time getting a feel for how much I'm removing. If you end up making one of them thinner than the other, they're not going to line up as well when you glue them up. You can attempt to go make the other one equally as thin using a, uh, a digital gauge. It's tricky. Um, you could, if you want to risk it, attempt to run these through the planer again or a drum sander if you have that. Um, I personally wouldn't take that risk uh, unless I was willing to lose the box due to my, my lips chipping out. So when you're going to sand this, if you're new at this, I highly suggest taking small pieces and trying to do just the areas between the edges. Avoid rounding these edges over if possible. Um, that's not as big of an issue, it's more aesthetic, but once you start taking off an uneven amount of thickness from the side, they won't uh, line up as well. The crisper that you leave these, the better they'll look when you glue it up. If you round them over, you'll be able to then see a little gap on the inside there. Again, it's a very minor aesthetic thing. If you're using a darker wood, you'll probably not even be able to notice it. So just take care when you're sanding not to go wild. Uh, I don't use a random orbit sander when my piece is smaller than the entire disc, and I generally avoid it uh, entirely because they have a soft bottom that can kind of wrap over. Um, I believe they sell hard bottoms for the sanders out there, so if you have one of those, you may be able to use the random orbit sander. And this obviously takes more time and effort. This is a, a much more involved process to hand sand all of this than to just take the random orbit sander and go over. But there's a good chance with the random orbit sander that you're going to round this and round these edges, which may or may not um, be a big issue for you, but this whole video is about getting the best possible glue up and looking miter that we can. So we want to minimize any variables that can make that worse. Now the last thing I want to go over before we get to the glue up part is how you're going to finish your box and whether you need to do it beforehand. There are a couple things to consider here. If you are using a water-based finish, you are going to have to wet this, raise the grain, and then sand it off. Now, again, with water, you have to be very careful not to put too much on there. So sometimes people just spray. I prefer, when I'm doing a mitered box, to squirt it onto a rag and then slightly brush it on there to ideally avoid this area. I generally prefer to use oil finishes because oftentimes that'll allow me to do them after the glue up or if I'm using something like a tongue oil, which needs a little buildup, I will pre-finish the insides. However, I would not spray the inside ahead of time unless you really tape this off. You have to ensure that no film finish is going to get on the insides of these. So oftentimes I'll oil the inside 
spray the outside or I'll just oil it all at the end. Um, if you want to try, you could try, if you believe from your glue up, you're gonna be totally perfect. You could obviously spray before because you're gonna be on the outside. But if you don't have to use a water finish, I suggest using an oil finish so that you don't have to worry about wetting your wood. Obviously mineral spirits uh, will not cause the grain to raise. They will evaporate very quickly. So I think they're a good choice too for cleaning off the wood. So just take that into consideration again, whether you're going to be putting water into your wood or not. And you will need to make sure it's fully dry if you do get any on here before we do any glue up because we want our glue to be able to sink in when we pre-glue. The final thing we have to do to get really good miters is have a really good glue up. Now I have another video on going through this whole glue up process that admittedly is unnecessarily long because I didn't know how to use iMovie. So I'm gonna go through here but cut it up a lot more so you just get the quick hits. The things we're gonna need for how I do it, blue tape, some glue, some water, a cup, a paintbrush, a clamp, and a straight edge. Now the entire idea here is that end grain soaks in a ton of glue. So we're gonna mix some water and glue to thin it up, paint it on here, wait a minute or two, and then put our actual glue on. We'll ideally pre-soak in those fibers so that our actual glue is connecting the wood to the wood. Having a decent straight edge is pretty important. This is just uh, from Home Depot, one of the track saw, circular saw guides. Uh, it's pretty good, pretty flat. Uh, I've used it for all my glue ups, so that's a relatively inexpensive way to get a big straight edge. You just need it as long as all your connecting joints are so that you can lay your pieces flat up against it to ensure that they are all in alignment. So we will align them all up. I like to put the bottom towards the straight edge because I'm gonna be inserting a base into it. Um, make sure you mark these so that you remember when you're doing this which side is up, especially if you've got a lid groove and a base groove. If you've cut your miters well and everything's done correctly, this will be incredibly flat and easy to just go across these. Um, obviously you'll see the little connection point there, but you'll be able to tell pretty quickly whether these meet up. If there's a gap like this, you're gonna have to go back and consider whether you had an initial straight edge on here, whether your table saw was at 90, whether when you went through the cut, your wood was flat or not. Um, this gives you a pretty good idea before putting the glue on the outcome of your miters. Um, so it's one last chance to kind of get a, get a chance to go back and recut something if need be. And I've had good success with just using blue tape on the joints, just two pieces for each of these. One downside of the blue tape method is you cannot see how the joint is meeting up. So you're gonna have to just kind of trust that you did everything correctly and it's sort of a surprise the next day when you find out whether your glue up was good or not. Obviously clamps um, will allow you to have visual access to it in case you need to shift something. So it's you know kind of one of those cost versus convenience sort of things. Now I'm gonna make sure, I'm gonna blow some compressed air in here and wipe these ends off. Make sure there is absolutely nothing in between these glue points or else they will not come together. It's very critical that you make sure there's nothing in there. We're now just gonna put some glue in here and you know, there's no hard and fast mixture here. I guess I'd say probably four to one glue to water. Um, you just want it thin enough that it soaks in pretty quickly. And you have to be careful here that you do not get glue and water on the side, inside face of your box. Obviously you can clean up the outside with sandpaper, but you wanna make sure that if you do get anything here, you have a wet towel and wipe it off pretty quickly. Um, you can do a little sanding inside later, but it's a lot harder once it's glued together. You're just gonna paint this on and you'll watch it just sink in and disappear. It's actually quite incredible. And you'll wanna put enough on there that you see every spot is wet. If you have your mixture to the right consistency, you'll be able to see it disappear into the wood. And generally by the time you're done here, it will look almost entirely dry here. And you'll come back and just apply a little bit to dry spots, but not too much. We still have to put regular uh, thickness glue on there. Some people let this fully dry before they do the glue up, but I only wait about two minutes until I start seeing a little more dry spot and then I just go ahead and do the glue.
Uh, so that's up to you. I'm now just going to apply my regular glue. And you want to get pretty good coverage here. Um, yeah, it's possible to use too much, but it's generally more likely you're not going to use enough. And we want a really good bond on miters. Uh, in my case, I often don't use um, splines, so I really need to make sure this glue up is good. One thing to really watch out for here is when you're painting your glue, the, the thicker stuff, don't paint it all the way to this edge because when you close these, uh, it will squeeze some there. And if you have too much, it will squirt out and it's a pain to try to get in there to clean it up. We're gonna take our base and we're essentially gonna fold this up. I personally don't glue my bases in. I want to have room for expansion. If you put the tape on correctly, it should hold itself together as you fold. Sometimes I like to put a few extra pieces of tape on there. Uh, two is probably fine, but I'm a, I'm a guy who worries, so I always go with a couple extra. I'm going to look for glue inside right now. I've got a little there. Now, some people like to let this dry. I generally don't. I like to take a little hobby knife and just gently pull it out. Some people use a straw. Um, I've just always done it this way, so that's up to you. And uh, then you'll let it dry and you'll be good to go. I can see we've got nice, tight miters. I'm very happy with that. All right, so the last thing I wanna just opine on here quickly is the spline debate. And I say debate because everyone seems to have some variation of a different view. There are some people who believe that you need to spline every miter and that, you know, a light breeze will make the thing fall apart if you don't do a spline. A spline generally is referred to as a cut is made through here. This is a spline jig I use. You can see it's quite dusty. You put your, your finished box in there, you run the table saw through, you've got a cut in there, you take another piece of wood and you stick it in there. Add, add some strength, absolutely. However, sometimes you just want that really nice continuous mitered look. And I rarely use splines other than for decorative purposes. Now what I will say is that the majority of my boxes are five, six inches or less. And in my experience, the smaller the box, the less need for the spline. If you're making a very large box, say you're going 10, 11 inches, I'd probably use a spline. Uh, I probably would. Now, it does not have to be an external spline. You can absolutely make internal stop cut splines uh, with the router. Uh, it's a little more difficult with a table saw and most people generally put them all the way through up or down, but it can be done. Um, if you are worried and this is one of your first mitered boxes and you're sitting there thinking, you know, this is a gift for someone. The last thing I'd want is for it to fall apart. Go ahead and put some splines in there. It's a fun little jig to make. This is just some MDF, uh, some scrap plywood, and then a piece of somebody's Ikea furniture shelf. On the bottom there, it took about 25 minutes to make. It's nice to have around. And in many cases, the splines look beautiful. They can absolutely look truly amazing if you have a nice contrasting wood. If you want this continuous look, but you're worried about strength, make splines out of the identical wood and it will be as close as you can get to uh, a matching kind of, I guess, waterfall look on the miter. So that's just my two cents that it's size dependent. The larger the box, the more likely you are to need splines. Depends on what the box is gonna be used for. Most of my boxes are, you know, they're used moderately. They're not carried around all day, but they are moved um, and I don't use splines. And in three years, I've never had one fall apart or anyone call me and tell me that theirs has fallen apart. So, you know, for what it's worth, that's just my experience. Again, a lot of that comes down to whether you did the glue ups and the cuts right. The worse your cuts are, the more gap you'll have like that or like that. Now, obviously those are exaggerated, but every time we get a gap, we're losing glue surface. So if you have a nasty little gap in there, even just this big, your glue surface is like just out here. There's not a lot there. Now you can attempt to go back and fill that in with some glue and sawdust, but it will never be as good of a bond as actually getting them together and gluing them together well. If you do have a nasty little gap, either inside or outside, um, I'd use splines. 
I would. I would use the splines just to be safe. Um, gaps on the outside are, in my opinion, uh, a little less concerning because they're usually smaller, but you know, that's up to you. Just wanted to show you guys how these miters turned out. Incredibly tight on all of them. So it looks like I didn't make any mistakes. Nearly perfect in my opinion. Uh, there may be a gap somewhere I haven't found yet, but even on this tiny little one, which I was a little worried about because there wasn't a ton of glue surface there, it seems to be pretty good. All right, thanks everyone. If you have any questions, comments, or something to add, throw it in the comments below, and uh, have a good one.